Hey everyone, it's been over two minutes, and yet again, the rapey world of the feminists has failed to manifest. <laughs> Hi, I'm Diana Davison, a Canadian eliminator of legal feminists. Yes, I'm an elf. I've been discussing the work of Elizabeth Sheehy, a law professor from the University of Ottawa, in a book that she wrote called Defending Battered Women on Trial. The last few cases, this one included, have discussed the situation of Aboriginals, and specifically Aboriginal women, in Canadian culture. I've avoided talking about it um, because it's such a big issue, and it's not a simple issue. And Sheehy, of course, tries to simplify it, as feminists all over the world try to simplify domestic violence, calling it something like male violence. And Simplifying these issues won't solve them. So I'm not going to get into it in great detail. When I do the written rebuttal to this book, then I, I'll definitely discuss my findings more thoroughly. But I want to discuss some simple layers to this issue today. And uh, because this case that I'm going to be discussing is a groundbreaking case in the situation of the Aboriginals in Canadian society. So, to understand the differences in the culture between Aboriginals and the way that they deal with crime and what's happened since the white man took over, then you kind of have to go back and look at how Aboriginal culture tries to deal with um, understanding and correcting criminal behavior in their culture. Um, primarily, they ask people who commit crimes in their culture to admit their guilt. That's step number one, admit your guilt and then they try to focus on reparations and restoring harmony in their culture. This is quite admirable. In fact, I think that um, that's something missing from the criminal system in the modern world, is that when somebody commits a crime, especially an egregious crime like murder, they owe a debt to the state. In Aboriginal culture, they owe a debt to the family of the victim, or to the victim themselves. Obviously, in murder, it would be the family of the victim. And this is to prevent blood wars and uh, revenge type activities. But ultimately, when a wrong is done, the person who was wronged or the family of, of the victim who was wronged, they're the ones who should receive some sort of reparation. And Aboriginal culture did that. Sheehy tells us that the problem with Aboriginals is that they are hyper responsible. So when you get a, an Aboriginal woman who kills, she's more likely to say, yes, I did it. And she calls this, she, he calls this hyper-responsibility. And she thinks the problem is that um, we're, we're allowing Aboriginals to take responsibility for their crimes. Whereas in our culture, especially defense lawyer culture, the idea is to get people to not claim guilt, to get them to say they're not guilty and then employ lawyers to you know, put the courts to great expense in order to try and show how they didn't do this thing. She isn't just a professor of law, she's a professor of social justice. And she is cl claiming, like a lot of these social justice warriors do, that she cares more about the Aboriginal culture than the average person does. I'm an average person. I actually did a little bit of research into the difference between our system and the Aboriginal system and she, he is, surprise, wrong. Aboriginals taking responsibility for their crimes is actually true to their culture. And it's something that should be supported. Although, I am going to agree that the method of deterrence isn't necessarily correct. I think that the reparation should be made to the families. And there should be an encouragement of that. What possibly might help in the situation in blending the Aboriginal culture with the Canadian culture that supplanted it. And there were some really bad things that happened in the past, but you can't move forward while you're focusing on the past. So the next case, she he rightfully discusses because it's a precedent setting case in Canada. It's that of Jamie Tennis Glado. On 17th of September, 1995, Glado was celebrating her 19th birthday. She noticed that her lech of a boyfriend, Reuben Beaver, who was also Aboriginal, kept leaving the party and she knew what that meant. So she was starting arguments with him because he was traipsing after other women. 
When Jamie's sister left the party, quite drunk, in fact, she was drunk enough that she threw up when she got home before passing out on her bed, uh, Beaver left the party and didn't return. So Jamie suspected that he was um, following her sister home and arrived at the doorstep, banging on the door. And of course he was there, he bailed out the window and her sister confirmed that he'd been there and he'd been advancing on her sexually. The story is a little convoluted whether they actually had sex or whether he was trying to initiate it and she repelled him. But she caught him in the act and she tracked him down. They had an argument in the street, it moved indoors and Beaver basically said, that's it, I'm out of here, I'm sleeping somewhere else tonight and he left the house. The incident occurred because Jamie decided that wasn't good enough for her, that uh, he left and he wasn't going to stay there and try and beat her so there's no fear for her life. She ran after him with a knife, stabbed him fatally and then yelled, I got you, you fucking bastard, in the middle of the street with witnesses. So unsurprisingly, she pled guilty. She here has a problem with this. But really, the ultimate issue with this case is not whether or not she was guilty or not guilty, it's that she appealed her sentencing. She also tried to appeal her verdict, but they informed her that you can't change your plea on an appeal. Like, you can introduce new evidence, but you can't change your plea. She he thinks that that's incorrect as well. This is a law professor. So, um, but what they did assess was um, that in her appeal, she said that as an Aboriginal, Canada, in fact, does have a clause saying that when you're sentencing Aboriginals, you need to take into account all possible alternative sentences instead of jail. And they said that they didn't think that applied. So the Supreme Court ruled that, uh, that it does apply and that the appeal court had made an error in that matter. But in the case of Gledo, who was sentenced for three years, she was already out on parole and the gravity of her crimes um, warranted a, a proper sentencing. So the Supreme Court decision that all courts must consider Aboriginal heritage has continued on even though they said that it shouldn't apply in cases of extreme violence. That part didn't live on. So we've ended up with a scenario that she he doesn't really want us to see in its full extent. And I'm going to give you another case here for comparison about how this GLADO ruling has um, affected the Canadian criminal courts. When Deanna Imard was given a two-year suspended community-served sentence for killing her Aboriginal partner, meaning she didn't go to jail at all, for killing a partner who had never hit her, who was never seen being violent towards her, in fact was quite a peaceful man, the victim's family said, alcohol is not an excuse and neither is being native. There should be justice for everyone, not one system for Indian and Métis people and one for white people. The victim was also Aboriginal. In fact, the majority of victims of Aboriginal crime in Canada are also other Aboriginals. But since the Gladau case, every time uh, an Aboriginal goes to court, the sentencing must order a Gladau report and they're quite underfunded and they can't always get these reports and the judges are really really frustrated because if they don't get these reports and they don't sentence somebody based on their Aboriginal heritage then their decisions and their sentencing can be overturned in a higher court and that's a waste of funding <clears throat> and it's also kind of embarrassing for them so they're struggling to try and live up to these expectations so obviously there has to be some sort of work done here to blend the two systems and to come up with an understanding but it's extremely complex because there's a lot of argument about how much um, you know white culture is allowed to interfere in Aboriginal affairs and yet the Aboriginals want to be protected by Canadian law the same as the white people so the question is are we uh, unfairly punishing them or is it that we're not protecting them equally by the law anymore. The issue that's mostly quoted is that Aboriginals are an extremely high percentage of our prison population in Canada despite them being a low percentage of the population and that is definitely a concern. It's something that needs to be looked at. But Elizabeth Sheehy is not going to solve this problem by calling their admission of guilt and they're, they're seeking some sort of way to, to remedy the situation or to 
come to terms with their life and what's going on in their lives. It's not going to be solved by saying, oh, you're being hyper-responsibility. You're not guilty. You're not guilty of anything. And nothing should ever happen to you. You should never have to spend a day in jail. Just go back out into culture, be fucked up, and continue to fuck up the rest of your own community. And Canada's just going to abandon you now. Because essentially, by not dealing with natives because we're afraid and we feel shame over past actions, what we've actually done is abandon the native culture. And this is just another example of how social justice warriors don't actually care about justice and they don't actually have a single bit of moral high ground. They're just people trying to make themselves sound better than everybody else. By hiding facts and creating narratives that are meaningless to anybody in the real world. So that's the case of Jamie Tannis Glado and that's my venture into the world of political incorrectness with the Aboriginal situation in Canada. And now for the Rape Joke of the Week, brought to us by Gon Connick. I called the Rape Assistance Hotline. Fuck me, turns out it's only for victims. Oh yeah, a final note for those people who have um, graciously donated to my campaign to buy some transcripts so I can get to the heart of the stuff that she doesn't want us to know about these trials. Um, I am investigating uh, my first attempt to get the crucial transcript of the Lavalie case, which was a precedent-setting case in the Battered Women's Syndrome in Canada. They told me, well, we don't have transcripts prior to 1998. This one was in 1997. So I'm pursuing that because we know she he got it so obviously I can get it from somewhere so anyways I am still waiting for information and from the looks of it it's going to take me a little bit of time to get all of the transcripts and to get the price quotes and so on but promisingly apparently I can get CDs so the thousand dollars that we've raised so far could buy us a lot more than we thought <laughs>